teach in the Masters of Child Development program in the College of Education and Organizational Leadership. Good morning, I'm Denise Kennedy, and I also teach in the College of Education and Organizational Leadership in Child Development. I didn't know until my master's program. I had a teaching assistantship, so they paid for my tuition plus a monthly stipend to be a teaching assistant. Um, it was a large lecture of, uh, for a child development course. I was responsible for the lab settings. And one day I had to fill in for the professor, uh, teach her lecture to the 180 students, and I loved it, loved it. So I knew from that moment on, within a couple of months of starting my master's program. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't know a lot of people that go into graduate school thinking I want to be a professor. So I went in uh, doing research because I was actually doing clinical work. And so I was working with children and families, uh, counseling, doing therapy, that type of thing. And then um, after doing that for a little while realized that it was really difficult, at least with my personality, because Children and families today are dealing with a lot of really difficult things, and I didn't think it was something I could do for 10 years because I brought it home with me and I worry about the children and the families. So um, when I was also in my doctoral program, we all have to uh, TA or teach classes, and I was actually fortunate enough to be able to teach my own class, and I had a GE class, and it was one of those big stadium, you know, seating, um, classroom, so I had a you know 150 students, and then I had four labs, but I luckily had TAs for my lab, so I didn't have to teach them, and I just really liked it, and it just kind of went from there. I think certainly, I mean, standard things like getting through to students and, and trying to. Um, make everybody understand the concepts and achieve well. Um, you, as with any classroom, you have different ability levels that come in. And so, to try and get students to a standard that you hold, um, I find that, particularly for me, my focus tends to be on their writing and their ability to communicate through written word. Um, that's been a, a continual challenge throughout my career is getting them to write well. And even in large lecture classes, I always had them write something um, to be able to work with that. But, um, but you want them to um, achieve, and you want them to be as passionate about the material that, as you are. Um, so figuring out ways to do that uh, is a welcome challenge. I enjoy it, but it's a challenge. No, I, I think the same. I mean, every class I teach, um, I teach the same class every semester in some cases. And it's never the same class because I always change it because I always try to make it better to try to engage them and get them at a higher level every class. So that's part of it. I think the other challenge has just been doing the research and trying to um, engage in more scholarly work been a challenge just because it's not done a lot um, at this university. So getting resources and, and um, finding time to do that has been a challenge. I think another challenge um, to speak of is the further, the, the more years that you're in this career, the further you are from their seat, right? And to, to um, I think a lot about what did I know when I was sitting there and um, keeping the material fresh and while I know it really really well because I've taught it so many times to constantly remember that they don't know it at all and to bring them to that point to the point we want them to be as opposed to because I've had teachers in the past that speak up here yeah. you know, and, and don't bring it back down to where I'm actually sitting. I don't think it is for me in particular because, um, you know, a lot of my students are practicing, so they're in the field, they're working 
as teachers. And when I can teach a class and give them new skills, new knowledge, new strategies, um, they're very open to that and they appreciate, you know, my goal is that they learn something in my class because as Lisa said earlier, well, we have variation in people's ability. And, you know, I have some students that are just, you know, they came to college from high school and they've never been in a classroom. Um, they have no idea what to look, you know, what they have to look forward to or not. Um, but teaching those students in the same class as someone that's been in the field for 25 years um, is challenging, but it's also a way to bridge gaps and to use their knowledge um, to help, you know, and also the fresh new student to um, make the seasoned person, you know, think about things differently. So it's, it's kind of this really nice, um, I, I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but it's a, it's a nice situation to have in these classrooms and, and I look forward to that. And I, I think, I think it's really how you go about it. Mm -hmm. um, because if you come off, I mean, you're teaching people who are in the trenches daily, and we are not in, right. in their trenches anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if I stood up there as this expert who knows textbooks and knows it all, and I'm going to tell you how to do it effectively, um, you're going to their guards going to go up and say, "Look, you know, you're in this ivory tower. You have no idea what I what I what I do on a daily basis." So I think kind of treating it as a partnership of sorts that, um, I mean, I, I tell my students on day one, you can teach me just as much as I can teach you, and that this is a collaborative effort. And so talking about your experiences day to day as it relates to the concepts that we're talking about is a very valuable mm -hmm. experience. But at the same time, they're teachers. They've been with children all day, and so they want to come in, and they're with adults for the first time all day, and they're chatty, and they, you know, um, I have some really funny stories of teachers doing things that they would never expect from their own students or allow with their own students, but they do it. But I, I see that more as they've been with children all day. And they come in at night, and, and that's okay, because <laughs> I know what it's like to be with children. I think um, I don't go into a classroom and just talk content. I go in and show my personal side as well. So I might come in one night and go, oh, I've been working all day, I'm really tired. Aren't you guys tired? I know you've been working all day too, you know, and, and show that I'm human, so to speak, um, so that I'm not just this professor who's unapproachable and that has some magical life where I don't work, I just march right in teach my material. Um, so they, you know, I, I show my inadequacies, of, so to speak, or my, my limitations at times, and just be human with them. Um, and they then do the same with me, and we create a real connection that way, so that if they, um, if they do feel inadequate in some level of their teaching, and I am, the, the information that we're talking about is helping them. I want them to be able to express that and feel safe in the environment to do so. So by me stating where I might be inadequate in my own teaching allows them to feel safe to do the same. Then we can talk about ways to make it better. I think I'm engaged with my students all the time. So uh, I get emails and I respond and you know, I get emails like, I see you're burning the midnight oil too, <laughs> and I still respond to them. Um, I know some students are very good with getting back to them, or you know, they won't respond on the weekends or things like that. But you know, one of the disadvantages of technology is I get email on my phone, so I always have it, and I try to um, respond to them, you know, in a timely manner. So, if they know that, so they're more apt to come to me with more questions or they're coming to my office um, oftentimes to ask me questions. Sometimes it's not related to my course. It might be related to another course or a job that they're thinking about or grad school or advice on that. So um, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's interesting that I just 
somehow iterate to them how available I am for them because I'm here to help them succeed. And it's not just succeed in my class, but to succeed in life. Um, you know, and we preach this lifelong learning at the burn and uh, you know, it's something that I, I believe that if I give them skills, it will translate throughout their life and not just in I think the research helps with that because when we're conducting research, we have to see what's currently being done. Uh, and so that uh, helps us uh, conference attendance where we can listen to what's going on and what the, the latest issues are um, is another way of, of staying current. But it, it all kind of, I think, falls to that research component and seeing what's there. Yeah. Well, I think conferences in particular, for me at least, um, that's where I go to kind of stay um, up on what's currently going on in the field um, in different areas. And, you know, that's where we get our ideas for research, and that's where we present our research, so I think that's the biggest thing that's going on. I also use my students, you know, and their experiences and what's going on in their classrooms um, to help me stay current. The acronyms, you know, um, that that they're using now, because otherwise I wouldn't know, you know. <laughs> I'm a parent as well, yeah. so I have children <laughs> in the school system, and that right. helps. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See all the slang now, and you know, you know what they're doing. I do make sure that I am up with technology. Yeah. If if students are talking, like when Pinterest became big, I thought I better get a Pinterest account so I can, you know, stay current and know what they're talking about. Right. And, Currently, with Denise and, and the others from our college, looking at teachers' efficacy beliefs and parents' efficacy beliefs. Um, I'm also working with colleagues at the University of Maryland, where I got my PhD, um, doing uh, work with teachers' beliefs about um, their efficacy beliefs for uh, global citizenship education, and how effective they feel they are in that area. Um, I'm doing work with some other colleagues in the College of Education looking at um, math anxiety and math efficacy beliefs. So those are three of my family. In addition to the one that Lisa and Andy and Cindy and I are working on with the parent efficacy and teacher efficacy beliefs, um, I have my study at the University of Illinois, the North Family Sisters and Brothers Program, and it's still going on today, so it's basically a social, emotional, social skills training program for brothers and sisters, teaching them how to regulate emotion, basically how to get along and not kill each other. <laughs> yes, I think, you know, our sibling relationships are usually the most volatile relationships, um, they're also the longest relationships that we have from birth to death. So if you can get along with your siblings, you can hopefully get along with anybody. And then at the University of Michigan, I'm still working on our family transition study there, which is a huge government-funded project that looked over time at families, um, children, characteristics like temperament and attachment. Um, we just submitted a paper on jealousy between siblings and social emotional development and how does that affect the family um, and, and uh, you know it's, it's ongoing so there's a lot of research going on I think here and other places and that we're involved with so okay. yeah, based on the presentation I did today I think well this venturing into math Efficacy for math is new for me, um, but working with Andy in the College of Education, um, he's kind of brought that piece in for me, and I think it's turning out to be an important piece that students really, pre-service teachers are, are pretty anxious about their own math ability as well as their ability to teach it to others. And I mean, I, I see it just in my classes, my undergraduates, that I advise, because I do academic advising also here, and 
they want to take the math requirement for general education because they think they're really bad in math. Mm -hmm. And you know, my response to them is, you're not bad in math, you just had a bad math teacher. So um, it's just a challenge, and I think overall nationwide, we're seeing that math and science are, are problems right now for kids, and, you know, in particular college students, because they're coming into college and not having that ability. But then they're then going out into the field and, and, and having teaching. that level of yeah. anxiety with their own students. So it's this cycle that has been right. perpetuating. And um, so I'm really anxious to get our hands more on that kind of data. Mm -hmm. I think it could have a profound influence on what's current in, in education. Mm -hmm. The next phase would be to continue our fall data analysis because we've so we have to data. look at the parent data, the parent data, the rest of the teacher data, um, conduct the interviews and the focus groups so that we can obtain that qualitative piece to go along with the numbers, um, and then moving into spring, do it all over again, collect the data. And, from and the idea too is, um, you know, we're applying for external funding, so we're talking about grants, so that we could continue this project um, at least for one more year. Uh, and again, some additional schools is kind of our goal, so we'll see if that happens and we can get some funding. I, I mean, I, I just think, you know, we're talking about research today, you know, that's kind of why we were here from the beginning, and, um, you know, I just want to stress how important it is. It's, it's not only important to the literature and the field, but you know, even on micro levels and, and helping students get into graduate school, you know, if, if they've been involved in a research project. Um, teaching students how to use the research to understand concepts or understand uh, material that they're studying in their classroom. So how can we apply what we've learned from research into our our jobs, you know, in terms of professional development, you know, as a teacher, as an educator, as a clinician, or something else. Um, I just want to stress the importance of it, and I, I hope that you know, more and more we get more people here involved in, in research and doing great things. And I think to add to that, I, I would second all of that, but to add to that is to teach students to be good consumers of research because mm. there's a lot of not so good research out there right. um, and oftentimes our students exposure to research is you know a brief snippet on the 11 o'clock news that you know research has found that if we drink wine with dinner we'll live longer yeah. and, you know but to actually go <laughs> to be critical thinkers right and to go to the source itself and and look and see what's being done and if we can teach them about research and make them good consumers of research they can then um, make, informed decisions. make informed decisions in the classroom and to teach for us in the College of Education as, as Denise was saying to get them to be good consumers of research so that they can go it, it's a whole added toolbox um, it's so that they can find some effective strategies that have worked in the past for others and then they can make good informed decisions in the classroom that are evidence-based.